<laughs> so uh, I'm Henry Gordon Smith. I'm founder and managing director of Agritecture Consulting, and I'm so happy to be here at SDL. It's been a really great event so far. So Agritecture Consulting is a global urban agriculture design and planning company, and we've worked in over 22 countries to date, helping entrepreneurs, corporations, all kinds of businesses understand and navigate the urban ag agriculture space. And today, we're going to be talking about urban agriculture and its role in urban planning. And I'm so excited to be with my colleague here today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Laurie Zapalak. I'm principal of Zapalak Advisors, a Boston-based practice focused on regenerative uh, site planning, uh, design, and development. We work from the single building scale to the region, often with public-private institutional partnerships focused on place-based economic development. Often we work in coastal cities, and we've had the chance to work with a number of shellfish uh, aquaculture companies and other key actors in the commercial seafood space. So today I'll be talking a little bit about shellfish aqu aquaculture as we proceed. So Henry, urban agriculture, what is it? And what are the key opportunities here? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Urban agriculture is the cultivation of food in and around cities. So anything happening in the metropolitan area or even in the peri-urban areas or suburban areas around a city would count as urban agriculture. It also includes not only the production of food, but also the supporting systems like food hubs. And as far as scale is concerned, it goes everywhere from small scale home gardens or the victory gardens we saw during the World War, all the way up to large scale commercial farms like Aero Farms. So what's the opportunity? Well, a recent study from last year actually looked at the Google Earth data and found there's an 80 to $160 billion opportunity for urban agriculture globally. So essentially 10% of our global supply of vegetables can be grown in and around cities just by using vacant spaces, rooftops, vacant indoor spaces, basements, lazy spaces around real estate developments can be converted into productive landscapes in urban areas. That can, that can mean that they can create jobs, they can transform the supply chain, providing fresh local food. They can also improve equity, depending on the kind of farm that they are. So we think this is really exciting, and it's not just this single data of this large opportunity, but actually there's certain drivers right now that are making this very exciting. So one of them is that cities are the leaders, right? Cities are where all of our food, most of our food is consumed globally. They're also where most of the investment is and where most of the technology is. So it's where a lot of the innovation around agriculture can happen. That's what agriculture really believes. Also, the demand for local food is growing, so consumers love it. We're seeing policy is driving that way. Uh, par Paris has had its third year of its annual urban agriculture competition with 33 new sites in that city, which has gotten them over 60% towards their goal of, of 30 hectares of new urban farming space by 2020. We also see that investment is going up. And we also see there's other drivers, including threats to the supply chain from climate change. And there's been already $4 billion in the South, for example, from hurricane losses that have affected um, agriculture. So if you take farming close to the city or indoors, that might respond to that as well. So some really exciting drivers that are making ur urban agriculture come back online and kind of restored back into the developing, developed world. I just want to say one more thing that globally already, it's impacting our food supply in a really positive way and is already estimated about 10% of our global food supply. And most cities were built around agriculture. We used to not develop where we lived without also developing what we were going to eat nearby. And I think what's really interesting now is in the face of climate change and transformations in our supply chain, we're trying to restore that trend. So now we're going to talk about understanding urban agriculture types a little bit and then we're gonna pass it on. So this is just a really easy spectrum of urban ag to help you understand there's a variety of options. We're not just talking about high-tech urban ag, we're also talking about the low-tech urban ag solutions. And the reason I wanna show this to you is because there's a big difference in cost, but also potential impact. Some of these are gonna be more aesthetically pleasing, some of them are gonna be more focused on jobs and economic creation. And what we really see at Agritecture is that all these urban agriculture types are tools in the toolbox. Yes. Things that planners like mm -hmm. you can use to say, this is the city, what can we implement here that's gonna have the biggest win for society, economy, environment? Yeah, and I think part of, part of our job is to really help people um, use their knowledge to make those decisions very judiciously. And that's something that I think we've heard throughout the talks over the last two days is um, 
the limitations that farmers have themselves. You know, it's, we're in a very interesting group because we have people here who do represent the farming community and the VC community, and we talk about money in very different ways. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, just making a connection to three uh, macro level trends that are really important to think about as we consider the opportunities for urban agriculture. You know, we, t we, talked, um, we talk a lot in urban planning about the trend from, from rural to urban, this, this migration that's happening globally. But something else to keep in mind is that people are uh, migrating and moving about the world at a more rapid rate than they ever have before. So this visual of international global migration um, looks at the flow of people and why this is important uh, among the 50 countries that receive um, and um, uh, countries from which people uh, immigrate uh, and, and literally sometimes move around the world. So one reason why this is so important is because that place knowledge that we have, that knowledge of how to survive and thrive in a particular environment, what to grow in that environment, sometimes is not relevant at all to where we move. And so thinking about one role of urban agriculture as we, as many cities like Miami receives new residents, urban agriculture can actually serve the purpose of helping root people into place and help them understand the landscape, cultural and natural, environmental, um, in, which, in which they are arriving. Um, you know, take Miami, for instance. It's a city that has gained more than a million people in pop its population growth over the last 20 years. It also has the largest percentage of foreign-born residents. So this is a very real issue of how you, as a new resident of a city, literally connect to place in a way that also hopefully will inspire you to be a steward of that place. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other very interesting situation that we all find ourselves in is that of the cities that we have built, um, in many cases, we are actually undoing our critical infrastructure. So take the case of Boston with the big dig in which the city and Commonwealth and federal government spent $22 billion to take down and submerge an elevated freeway in its place, a 17-acre linear park was, uh, was, was created. The creation of that green space is an ongoing process, and it's been very interesting to see how it has changed programmatically to include um, more climate resiliency strategies, as well as to address food and food systems and, and urban agriculture in new and different ways. Um, cities across the US certainly have, and across the world, have opportunities like this. Seattle has a great opportunity happening right now. And one of the things that's been very interesting to watch has been the secondary level of investment as this type of intervention has spawned um, the rehabilitation of buildings and landscape now kind of expanding from this linear park. So the transformation of the rooftops of existing buildings are taking place right now as an example. So we have these opportunities. Now more than ever, we're trying to make existing building stock more energy efficient, more climate responsive, and at the same time, there is, there is that chance to integrate urban agriculture in really creative ways that ground people and connect people to place maybe differently than they have been before. Uh, next slide. Um, this is where uh, I want to point out something that uh, for some people uh, may sound about a little bit critical in terms of what we've talked about over the last couple of days. Um, this whole idea of technology pull. You know, technology um, is tools. It's a set of tools, right, Henry? Right, but it's a um, double-edged sword. Neither right? good or bad. Yeah. It's how we use these tools. Um, you know, Lewis Mumford in the 1930s making, um, uh, uh, kind of taking a critical viewpoint of where the auto technology might take American cities, pointed out this idea of the difference between polytechnic ideas um, where technology, both high and low, are combined to help solve human problems. He said that's one way we can go. We can also, if we're not careful, be monotechnic and let one technology dominate or let all technologies dominate our time, our space, our money. And if we look today, technology is nearly pervasive. 
you know, most people probably have know exactly where their phone is in this room. <laughs> um, so, you know, this question of what does this mean for the recreation of our urban environments? Because the, the trend is we want to technologize, we want to amplify. But as we think about urban agriculture, you know, to the extent that we can bring the green back into our cities or strengthen those connections with the green, bring nature back into our cities so that they are living, breathing, blue and green places for people and not machines, that I think is where we need to attempt to guide this activity that's underway. I think the technology pull point is a really good one. I came into Columbia when I was studying with really kind of bright, doughy eyes about vertical farming, and I was so optimistic about it as a technology. I took a history of agriculture in the US course, and I was kind of brought back down to earth about that double-edged sort of technology and how when the first mechanized equipment came to farmers, they sure, they solved a lot of problems, but then they had to hire a mechanic to fix the tractors or get gasoline for the tractors. And so there's always this kind of battle between that. And I think Urban agriculture in the context of the city has similar challenges, where we can get excited about one type, and we can say, this is the future of agriculture, this is going to feed our cities. When in fact, as you can see here, there are different types of impacts that each kind of urban farm can have. Some of them can be more aesthetic, which can be really valuable to inspire us to live greener, to act more green in our behavior, to love our city in a different way. Some of them can be social, like some of you talked about, the integration of immigrants. We see that in Toronto, we see that in Miami. Mm -hmm. These can be places where they can grow their own food, learn the language. Some of them can be more environmental, like rooftop farms that manage rainwater or reduce the heat island effect. And some of them can be more economic, like aero farms that's produced 60 jobs out of a warehouse that was nothing before and provided new economic resilience in that community. So what we really want in agritecture is that urban planners can understand those trade-offs in a very data-driven way. And our clients can understand those trade-offs if they're choosing to plan a farm to achieve the goal that they want. Because I think that's how the future of these farms need to be planned out in cities. Um, yeah, and just continuing right on that point, you know, there are some really exciting things that we can do, I'd say, with very little technology. Take um, the fact that GIS is essentially ubiquitous in the management of our cities today. So this is just an image of, um, of Alexandria, Virginia, and its building stock. And what we have simply done is to characterize the um, individual building footprints using different colors to represent different ages of buildings. Now, why is this important in the context of urban agriculture? Um, and one, we can also see and count and quantify the actual total square footage by the age of buildings represented. Mm -hmm. So why this is important is because we can use tools that we already have and data that we already have, in fact, to start to move in the direction of thinking about urban agriculture from the single building standpoint to the entire block, district, or city. So in that way, we can move from urban agriculture projects to really thinking about urban agriculture systems, going back to our very beginning talk, and how this can integrate with existing urban systems. And I think that, that point, and Henry, I mean, you, you stated it really well, is to me what's so interesting and the competitive advantage about urban agriculture is it's, it has a chance to play with these other urban systems. So for instance, um, you know, in Boston, um, kind of building on the food lore idea, um, we have an organization called BAG, Boston uh, Area Gleaners. What gleaners do is they go and they harvest crops from about 50 uh, area farms. So they're harvesting surplus crops that the farmers do not intend to sell or they're the uglies. And they distribute this, um, this produce to organizations throughout the Boston area. Last year, they harvested some 800,000 pounds of produce. This year, they hope to hit a million. So that type of integration works in part because we have a population in Boston. There's a demand for that produce. We also have the supply of volunteers. And we have kind of the philanthropic system that also supports that activity. But certainly, it's a win-win for the farms. And it's a win, it's a win for the farms and for the Boston area community. Yeah, I also think this data is really interesting and in how it's becoming proliferated because from an urban agriculture design perspective, we can now look at, okay, if there's buildings that are older than 1970, they can probably support a soil-based rooftop farm. Exactly. If there's buildings that are 40,000 square foot or larger, the economics for rooftop greenhouse could make sense. 
So now we can really look at all those available spaces you know, as a canvas to really design a resilient food system, which is exciting. Sure. We couldn't do that before. Yeah, and I can layer on, oh, just really quickly, you know, and then I can layer on the fact that, um, you know, that buildings built, you know, 75 years before are eligible for different types yeah. of federal tax credits. So this is where kind of having these different types of knowledge and hopefully combining them in collaboration really um, can unlock new solutions. So we have a couple case studies uh, from each of us to kind of showcase a little bit more about what we do. Uh, first of all, with your um, aqu aquaculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I've had the privilege to work with this company called Island Creek Oysters, based in Duxbury, Massachusetts, about 45 minutes south of Boston. Their tagline is, we grow the finest oysters in the world and have a damn good time doing it. <laughs> Why this is important is they have almost single-handedly made oyster farming sexy again in Massachusetts. So when you talk about the fact that we are losing, we are losing our ranks of farmers, the fact that all of a sudden you have people interested in farming practices as they sit at their desk jobs in the financial district in Boston, that's really important. Um, why this company is so interesting to me in terms of what they've done that's disruptive um, they had a chance to acquire an 11-acre site on the waterfront in Duxbury um, at the end of, of 2017. That site was a former marine science research campus. It has 60,000 existing square feet of historic homes and purpose-built lab space, which is perfect for an oyster farm. <clears throat> so one of the things that Island Creek had done, that they, they are a vertically integrated company. They have relationships with now six restaurants in the Boston region. Um, but they started a um, direct-to-commerce program, or pardon me, direct-to-chef and e-commerce program almost out of the gate. So if you are getting a hankering for oysters, you can place your order and they'll be delivered to your house by FedEx tomorrow morning. Um, but what's interesting is that they had also started a, um, a farm tour program before they acquired this site. When we started master planning the site, we knew we wanted to dramatically expand consumer engagement. And um, so the planning uh, very much was focused on really enrolling people in every aspect of oyster farming, from hatchery activities to, to the retail front. Um, and along the way, Island Creek um, ex has expanded not only its farm tours, so if you think about diversification opportunities that are also revenue generating and about consumer engagement, this is a great example. Uh, this summer, they, they've hosted 4,500 people at, as part of the farm tours at $100 a pop. So an important revenue stream for the farm. Um, some 10,000 people have now visited the waterfront raw bar. And I will say it's a beautiful site. I encourage you to come. But what's important about this along the way is that Island Creek has been telling their story using social media in a really effective way. But by bringing consumers onto their site, they are now able to make that connection between the, the, what happens in the experience on the site with their online storytelling. So you as the consumer in Iowa, maybe you visited Island Creek, um, can see and kind of still be a part of the story it is as it unfolds on social media. And as you know, I think it's an interesting metric. They had about 10,000 followers when we opened um, this new site at the beginning of, um, of 2018, and they've got about 40,000 social media followers now. So that's not just due to the site, but I think it speaks to the, you know, to the importance of storytelling that, we, that we've heard. Um, but in terms of their ability to, to be disruptive um, you know, for a company that already has an e-commerce platform, uh, they, they certainly have dis disrupted and will continue to disrupt through this model. Um, in New England and beyond. <laughs> so moving over to New York City, uh, our client Farm One is the only and the first commercial vertical farm in Manhattan. And so when we think about the supply chain for high-end restaurants in Manhattan, they will ship in by plane you know, refrigerated microgreens and specialty herbs for their customers. So whatever they need for their menu, they're going to get it no matter what 
the carbon footprint. And as these chefs begin to want to respond to consumer needs for transparency and for localization, they struggle to get that variety. So Farm One was so exciting because what we did is we helped them find an unused space. This is their second farm location. It's about a 1,200 square foot vertical farm in Tribeca, one of the most expensive parts of the world. And we found an unused basement space converted into a vertical farm, and they grow over 500 varieties of rare plants things that have never been grown indoors, and they do it for the chefs on demand. And I think it really showcases, again, not only what is possible with vertical farming and what's possible with urban agriculture and unused lazy spaces, but also how the impact of the aesthetic and the beauty of these farms can transform society. So they also have tours. Um, I think it's about 99 bucks, but you get a Prosecco <laughs> at the end as well. And it's really beautiful. It's a great place for a date, for example. And, um, and, and what, what happens is when people go through there, they answer a lot of questions. And inspires new urban farmers as well as they learn about the technology. And that's the power of this, is, is showing we can bring agriculture back into the city, we can have profitable businesses like this. And so while they may not be feeding the world, they are transforming the supply chain, making it closer, and informing and inspiring many, many others. So what's next? We're going to talk about some new predictions. Um, as I mentioned, at Agritecture, we're all about data. And so we've been consulting over 100 projects around the world in 22 countries, 48 cities. But what we're kind of announcing today is our Agritecture Designer, which is our new way to scale up our impact. And so this is an online feasibility study and concept development tool where anyone can access our database of thousands of models for urban agriculture to design their business plan. And so what we're trying to do here is we're trying to remove the barriers for new entrants to engage in urban agriculture. You could be an investor looking at the space. You could be a new urban farmer, which is our main target. You could be a student just looking to figure this out, or you could be an architect or an urban planner. And we're trying to remove all those barriers and provide the benefit of 10 years of research on the best practices and best models for urban agriculture to match what you need. So if you can basically go here and say, I, I, this is my budget, this is what I think I want to grow, this is where I'm located, and it'll tell you what kind of farm and example farms that are similar to that idea. And then this is actually a, uh, a visual of the light feasibility tool, which is the next stage of the product, where you can actually dive dive deeper and do a 10-year projection and really look at your economics and control what you input into there some more. So if you're interested in that, you can go to agritecture.com slash designer and sign up to be on our beta. We're launching October 28th. It's awesome. Tiana. Oh, am I just this? Okay, so what else is next? We both agree that um, automation and tech is going to be a big part of what's next. You know, labor continues to be one of the most difficult things for all kinds of farmers, including urban farmers. So the way that data and automation plays a role in urban agriculture is going to be huge. I think the increasing relationship between architects and, um, and urban agriculturalists, I call myself an agritech, um, working together is going to be a big part of it. And I think also the changing and transforming practices in the food industry, this kind of need for transparency, uh, following consumer trends or even new proteins, these are all going to play a role in what's next in the urban context of food production. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting to kind of come back to the start and think about, um, you know, not only Jamie Oliver, chef, pointed out some years ago that um, many first graders cannot identify a tomato, um, which is tragic, uh, but this whole idea that we need to continue to educate um, our children, ourselves, um, our new residents of our cities, this whole idea of what farming is in, in all of its variations from community gardens to very high tech um, strategies like Henry's described, um, so that we, our cities are places of, of engagement um, and that they're places of human interaction around nature and food, which we know food is such a cultural thing. And for it to continue to be that, even as our technology and our relationship with it changes, that also means we are going to need to continue to update our building and zoning codes. Um, and. I would say that many of you in the room have an opportunity, particularly as you are producing these new technologies or new financing strategies um, to shape the codes in the cities and places that you, um, that you hope to be working because that is essentially how it happens. So I would encourage you to do that. And then, and then thinking, you know, related to that, this whole idea of, you know, this transition from the gardener to the farmer architect to the agritech to the supply chain manager. Um, the exciting thing about this is that there, there's a whole host of jobs to be created. Um, the designer of the truly 
building integrated agriculture um, that we really don't have yet. We don't even have a, a view of what that is yet. So that is what our future um, you know, can hold, but along the way, we need to be sure that this foundation of efficiency and climate resilience and feeding our, pop, feeding our, our fellow citizens um, you know that those th that foundation does not. Um, you know that we we <laughs> that that stays at the core of what we're doing. So um, <clears throat> we're putting a lot of pressure and a lot of demand, uh, asking you to solve very complex problems. Um, but I think that that's what we realize that that that's why we're all here is to try to together to figure this out. So. Um, I think we would encourage any thoughts, questions, ideas that you have. Um, it's been a great two days, and um, a big thank you to Mo and team. I know he's yes, going to come up definitely. here in a moment. But um, thank you for the time, and we're happy to chat more. Thank you. Mm -hmm.